Alrighty, so we are going to be starting in on electrostatics, which is chapter 22, uh, it's unit 7, and this is now kind of a transition point in the year. So we've ended out uh, the half of the year, which is mechanics, which is the, the big things that move and, you know, things like cars and balls and planets. And then we're getting to the smaller things. Um, so electricity is things that you generally don't see on a day-to-day -day basis, but we can see the effects of them. Um, so we're going to talk about things like electrical forces and charges, conservation of charge, Coulomb's law, conductors and insulators, charging, charge polarization, electric fields, electric potential, and electric energy storage. So basically, how can we store some energy? So electricity is kind of given to a wide range of phenomena. So lightning falls under electricity. The spark that happens when you strike a match, that falls under electricity. You know, what's holding atoms together, that falls under electricity. We're going to look at a very small portion of that right now. We'll get into some of that stuff later, but right now we're just going to look at electrostatics. So this just involves the electric charges and how those electric charges kind of interact. So the forces between them, the fields that surround them, and kind of their behavior and materials. Kind of the central rules of, of electricity has to deal with the idea that opposite charges are attracted to each other and like charges repel. So if I had two positively charged balls and two negatively charged balls, you know, the two positively charged would repel each other, the two negatively charged would repel each other. So if I had one positive, one negative, they'd attract each other. Right? You learn this probably kind of in middle school when you're, you start getting the basics of electricity uh, taught to you. Now, where do the charges actually come from? Right? So the most fundamental level, it comes from the atom. So we know protons um, have positive electric charges, and they repel, um, but the, they attract negative charges too, kind of going around. So we've got that whole idea of positive nucleus, negative electrons going around. And there's also some neutral neutrons that are kind of hanging out there inside the nucleus. If I was to take one of those atoms away, uh, sorry, one of the electrons away from the atom, I get a positive ion. But instead, what if I was to give it some extra electrons? Like, here, have some extra electrons. I get a negative ion, right? So again, we learned about these in chemistry. They have a positive ion, negative ion. We started to talk about ionic bonding between them. Well, what you didn't realize is that that bond was caused by electric forces, which we're kind of talking about here now with, we're going to get into Coulomb's Law. With the electrons um, that are in the atom, the innermost are attracted very strongly um, to that oppositely charged nucleus. And the outermost, because they're further away, they're a little bit looser and can be dislodged more easily because they're further away from the nucleus, which is positively charged. Just a little quick example here, check in. So when you brush your hair and scrape electrons from your hair, what happens to the charge of your hair? So I'm taking electrons off of my hair and they end up in my comb. What happens to my hair? Does it become A positive, B negative, C, A and B, or D neither? And the answer is positive because I took those electrons from one place, which means I've now made my hair into like a positive ion. And I've made the comb into like a negative ion. And this is the idea of conservation of charge. All right. Any charge charging process, no electrons are created or destroyed. They're just transferred from one material to another. So if you take like an amber rod and you rub it with a piece of fur, you're gonna whoosh, steal some electrons from that piece of fur and you're gonna get a negatively charged amber rod. Studying these different charges and how they can interact was the work that Charles Coulomb focused on. So he figured out that the force between charges was gonna vary directly by the product of the charges because he realized if he could produce more charge, there was gonna be a greater force. But he also realized that the further apart those charges were, there was an inverse squared relationship of the force to that distance. Just like we had with gravity. Just like Newton found with gravity, that whole 1 over d squared, the inverse squared law. So the two pieces were force was proportional to q1 and q2, because there's going to be two charges that are interacting, and that the force was inversely proportional to the distance separating them. If the charges are, are like... So basically two positives or two negatives. The forces are repulsive. If the charges are not alike, so you got one positive and one negative, the forces are attractive. The unit for charge is actually going to be known as the Coulomb, because you know, Coulomb did most of this research, and 
eunuch got named after him. And we use a capital C to denote it. And the form of the law looks very similar to Newton's law of gravitation. Okay? And ends up becoming F equals K Q1 Q2 over D, squ D squared. Now the K ends up being 8.988 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. Now unlike Newton, Coulomb actually took the time to find this constant for his relationship, for that force to become a law. So now, according to Coulomb's law, okay, which again, just to kind of remind you here, is that F is equal to K Q1 Q2 over a D squared. A pair of particles that are twice as far apart will experience a force that is half as strong, one quarter as strong, twice as strong, or four times as strong. It ends up being a quarter as strong because it'll be one over two squared. So one over two squared is one over four, so a quarter. Within charges, we end up finding some interesting things out. One thing is charge polarization. Okay, so atoms and molecules uh, in which the charges are aligned to be slightly excessively positive or negative one way or the other can get this thing called charge polarization. So an example of this is if you rub an inflated balloon in your hair and then you try to place that balloon near a wall, it'll sometimes stick. And that's because the wall can become polarized. It can pull, you know, more of a positive charge to one side of the material and then more of a negative to the other side because it'll polarize itself. Another cool example of this, and it'll prove to you that water is a polar molecule, is if you take, rub that balloon in your hair, get a very thin stream of water coming off of a faucet, and put the balloon near the water. One of two things will happen. It'll either bend the water away from the balloon or it'll bend the water towards the balloon, just depending on how you've charged up the balloon, uh, whether you've got a negatively charged balloon or a positively charged balloon. Most of these charges need to flow in a material. So you either have a conductor or an insulator primarily. So a conductor is a material in which one or more of those electrons in the outer shell, remember we talked about outer valence shells in chemistry, is not very well anchored to the nucleus. So this is mostly metal, so things like copper, aluminum, gold, um, silver. Those other electrons are kind of free to move. They, they'll pass along within the material. They become conducting electrons very easily. Then you have insulators. So these are materials in which the electrons are tightly bound and they belong really to one particular atom. They don't want to wander around. They don't want to be shared. Um, so things like rubber, glass, right? rubber is primarily carbon. Um, the inert gases, right, so the noble gases, they generally have those tightly bound electrons. They don't like to move around that much. That's another example of a, of a really good, good insulator. Then it gets us into semiconductors. So semiconductors are really important to understand because most of our modern technology from like 1960 forward has depended on, or even 1950s, has depended on the idea of a semiconductor. So these are materials that sometimes behave as an insulator, sometimes behave as a conductor. So they kind of fall in between the resistivities, which is something we'll talk about a little later, of insulators and conductors. And in their purest state, they act as an insulator. When you give them some impurities, um, they start to conduct, and they conduct depending on different you know, requirements. Sometimes if you give them a little extra electro electrons, sometimes if you shine light on them, um, sometimes it's temperature dependent, but one example is, you know, if you take a selenium plate and you expose it, expose it to light, charges will start to like flow within it. You know, and that's how we kind of get to the idea of like a solar panel was the idea that charges will start to flow within the material when it's exposed to light. So a quick little check in here. So when you buy a water pipe at the hardware store, there's no water included in the pipe, but when you buy copper wire, the electrons, a, must be supplied by you, just as the water must be supply, supplied for the water pipe. B, they're already in the wire. C, they may fall out, which is why we insulate all wires. Or D, none of the above. The answer is B, they're already in the wire because those electrons want to stay around the copper atoms. Okay? It just so happens, though, that the outermost electrons are willing to be passed along within the material to allow the electricity to flow or the electricity to conduct. Another thing to talk about for charging is this idea of charging by friction. So one thing you can do is charge up items like by stroking 
cat's fur on a glass rod or an amber rod or combing your hair. You can actually charge up things or when you rub your shoes on the carpet or, you, or your socks across the carpet and you, you know, zap the door, the doorknob. And that's because materials can transfer electrons from one object to another just by kind of rubbing against each other. Um, we're going to talk about something called the Van de Graaff generator during this unit, and that's what it does. It basically has a metal comb that's in there that rubs, rubs against a rubber belt, and it transfers the electrons based on that. The other type is charging by induction. So this is the good old thunderstorm and lightning. So what happens in the thunderstorm is kind of ice crystals and all that fun jazz kind of get pulled up through the thunderhead. And in the process, you get a little bit of kind of friction occurring between those particles, and you get charge separation. So top of the cloud might be positive, bottom of the cloud's negative. Now, occasionally, just within the cloud, right, I might get zap, 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 cloud to cloud lightning, we call it, right? But occasionally what happens is we start getting those charges that are on the bottom of the, the cloud inducing a charge in the ground. So the really high points on the ground, the trees, the tall buildings, the antennas, things like that, start to become points of attraction for the charges through induction. So all of a sudden the ground becomes positively charged, the bottom of the cloud is negatively charged, and then, you know, one, all of a sudden, one of these electrons decides it wants to go zap. Or this one goes zap. And we get the whole idea of cloud to ground lightning. So another case for induction is I could start with a rod that I just charge up, you know, by rubbing it on fur or something like that. And they have these two metal spheres I have near each other, A and B. So I don't touch the rod to, to sphere A. I just bring it near it. So it makes sphere A want to be positively charged. Sphere B gets all the extra electrons and becomes negatively charged. Now I pull that tower that's got sphere B on it away. And all those extra electrons stay on sphere B. I've now, through induction, kept that other sphere charged as negative. Again, depending on the process, whether I start with the frictional charging, which I have to do to charge up the rod, or then the transferring through induction, I can then, you know, store charges in different ways. Electric charges have to be caused by kind of electrons or protons. And something you may have heard of before or not is something called charge quantization. All right. Or at least maybe you've heard the term quantum mechanics. So this whole idea of quantum mechanics or charge quantization is, is the fact that I can't have half of an electron, or I can't have a quarter of an electron. I can only have a whole electron. So in terms of charges, all of my charges have to be based on whole electrons. So the smallest unit of charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. You know, nothing, nothing smaller than that. That's the smallest I can possibly have. Now, in terms of a coulomb, a coulomb is a very, very large unit. So one coulomb is 1.6, uh, would be, you know, divided by that 1.6 times 10 to negative 19 coulombs per electron would give me 6.25 times 10 to the 18th electrons in one coulomb of charge. That's a lot of electrons. Um, those lightning bolts could have 20 to 30 coulombs of charge in them. Now, on a day-to-day -day basis, though, we're probably not going to deal with a full coulomb of charge. We're probably going to deal with micro coulombs of charge. All right, And micro brings back one of our nice little mathematical friends here, mu. But this time, mu is a prefix, so mu c is micro coulombs, and it would be 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. So this idea of charge quantization is basically saying like everything when you get down to the lowest level is basically like built out of Lego bricks. You can't have half a Lego brick. You know, it's that smallest one-by-one -one brick. That's the smallest we can have here. Nothing smaller. Um, that's what charge quantization means and what quantum mechanics is based on.